right, well, good morning and welcome to Wells Branch Community Church. I'm so glad that all of you are here. My name is Chris Plugginpole. I'm one of the pastors here on staff and just so pumped that we can start this new football season out together. Uh, so listen, way to go. Come to first service so you won't miss a, a, a snap. I know that's on everyone's minds. And so way to go uh, for a lot of you. So we are in a new series uh, because it's kind of a new ministry year for us. And it's uh, called Bless 2.0, which if you see a two, that means we probably had a one and we do. And we did. And we did that last year. And that was a theme of last year was bless. And so we're doing it again this year because we really want to um, inculcate bless into the culture of our church. Okay. And so if you're like, what does that even mean? I want to kind of give you what bless stands for. Cause it's not just that we want to be a blessing cause we do, but it has like a another meaning. All right, ready? Here it is. It's begin with prayer. And whenever we see this, like this is the heartbeat of like everything we do. We want to bathe, we want it to, be, to begin it with prayer. Um, when we want to reach people for Jesus, we want to pray about it, right? You, you, that makes sense because we're a Christian, all right? Then we want to, so prayer and then care. If you didn't know what that uh, little emoji was, that's a care sign on your Facebook. Whatever, you know when someone says something politically different than you, uh, but you don't want to agree with it, but you can't say nothing, you care it, right? That's what you do. Uh, so uh, anyway, we, we want to be able to listen, eat, and serve our neighbors, well, uh, people that are around us, so that they know uh, that you have an actual care for them. So that's what L-E-S right here. And then finally, share. Like we really want to share the good news of Jesus Christ to a world that we really, really believe uh, needs Jesus. Now, um, anytime you see three circles, what does that mean is coming? Come on. Venn diagrams are here. I am a Venn diagram person. So if I can find a way to get a Venn diagram in, I will. All right. So uh, I know that that's exciting for everybody. Now, listen, uh, there are some things here that I wanted you to see. Like if I have some prayer people that love to share, like that is an awesome thing. Those are my Jonah people. They are bold. They're willing to risk the relationship. And we need people that are on fire to, to share Christ because they're intimate relationship with God and they are willing to have the awkward conversation even when it might risk a little bit of the relationship, okay? And then also, um, when it comes to this, we want people to pray and care about people. Uh, the, the best person that I can think of is St. Francis of Assisi, like the guy would, he wouldn't hurt a fly kind of a guy. Uh, and he loved people. He was all about poverty, chastity, and obedience. And so a, a medieval friar back in the day started his own order, uh, and Franciscans are renowned today for the way they love and care for people. And then finally, um, uh, Peter, like the guy, listen, when it came to not praying, uh, he was great at just taking action. All right. And sometimes you need people to just know the right thing to do and then do it. Um, and we're going to talk about how that has the downside as well. But uh, the reality is we need people that are, are action-oriented, people that understand that the gospel message needs to be shared because there's people who need Jesus. And so we really believe that. So I think that that's where we're going to go this morning. And we're going to be in uh, the book of Colossians. So we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4. We just got a new thing of Bible. So if you don't have a Bible, congratulations. For happy September 8th. You are going to get a gift from us. Uh, to have your very own hardback black Bible. Uh, you'll find it somewhere in your vicinity. And we're going to be in Colossians chapter 4 today. And if you're not familiar with the book of Colossians or letter to the Colossians, um, the, Colossians 1 is about the supremacy of Christ. Colossians 2, uh, Paul writes this one verse that I just love. He says, just as you receive Christ Jesus as Lord, so walk in him. So in the same way you receive him, walk in him. And then the rest of that chapter is sort of dedicated to like, let it being free in Christ. And then chapter three is about um, not letting the, the darkness of the world clothe, uh, take you down. Clothe yourself with Christ, not with the world. And then you can see that in the way that you treat your spouse, the way that you treat your children, uh, the way that you treat your boss or employees. And then he's going to talk about how you are to treat those who are far from God. And if you are far from God, this morning and you're here, I am so glad you're here. Like if you're thought like you're a person here that I, I don't do Jesus, but I am really excited about what you guys have going on here. And I've been either drug here. I got asked enough times. I finally caved and I'm so glad that you're here. And I wanted to ask God that would bless, he would bless the reading 
and the proclamation of his word this morning as we get into what it is to share the gospel. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for uh, your grace in our lives. Jesus, I'm, my prayer is that we would proclaim your word. We proclaim your grace. We proclaim your mercy. And Lord, we'd watch you work in a really, really unique way as we need you, Jesus, um, to move and to speak in the lives of people that are looking to take the next step with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Everybody said, amen. All right, so Colossians 4. We're only, this is gonna be, we're looking at four verses, all right? So, or technically five, I guess. Five verses. Colossians 2, or Colossians chapter 4, verse 2, all the way to verse 6. All right, so this is, I can't wait for this because this is so exciting for me. So Colossians 4, verse 2 says this, continue steadfastly in prayer. So this is what Christians do. If you're new to Christianity or this isn't your thing, Christians pray. It's what we do. Now, the thing that was odd about this, he says, being watchful in it with thanksgiving. Now, whenever I hear be watchful, uh, um, I had in the military, you would have, you know, the, the first watch of the night or uh, you were on guard. And this kind of makes it feel like this is like warlike language. Like you need to be praying, being watchful. And that's exactly what that's about. Because I think just in general, when I think of prayer, I think about tranquil settings. You're thinking harmonious, like nothing's going on. But, but in this, Paul's like, like hey, when you get in your, on your knees in prayer, you labor before God, you're ready for war. And that sounds like wildness. And so, there's the, so you're being watchful, you're on guard, but then also you're thankful. Okay, so I want to kind of see how like you could not be like that. And of course, the example of this would be Peter. Right? You guys remember in, in Matthew 26, uh, Jesus, Peter, James, John, they're all in the, the garden and, and Jesus is wrecked with anxiety about um, taking on the whole sin of the world. Like he's like praying, God, if, if, this, um, if this cup can be passed from me, let's do it that way. And he gets, he's like, Peter, James, John, hey, I need you guys to pray with me because I'm, he's sweating blood. He is, in, he's distressed. And he came to the disciples after he tells them, hey, I need you guys to pray with me. And he found them sleeping. He said to Peter, could you not watch with me one hour? And I love the way that this, what he meant was pray, but he said, watch. Like, I need you to pray. Now, why? Because watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation because there is a real reality, Peter, and I'm praying for you and praying for everything that I don't want you to kind of dip your toe in and then break because uh, you aren't being watchful. You may not enter into temptation. They said the spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. And then this other thing about being thankful, I, I, I think this is one of those things I think we, we sort of take for granted. We'll look at this. This is Paul writing again. He says, listen, rejoice always, pray without ceasing. Again, second shortest ver verse of the Bible, in just in case you were wanting to write that down. It's 1 Thessalonians 5, 16, pray without ceasing. Give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. Now, look, look at this. All circumstances? Like when sorrow comes, when... Uh, the moment, like the thing that I've been praying for, hoping for, doesn't happen when I lose a loved one, when uh, the job doesn't come, like I should just be like, yay! No, no, no. Remember, you're allowed to be sad. Did you know you can be a Christian and be sad at the same time? In fact, Psalm 88, one of my favorite psalms. Like you, most psalms are like, hey, it really stinks, really stinks, really stinks. But you know, God is good. And he's going to turn it all around. Psalm 88 it stinks, it stinks, and ends with darkness is my only friend. And everyone's like, wow, that was depressing. Like there are moments, all right, and there's one psalm. There's only one psalm like that. And so you're allowed out of all, if you kind of just take the way your life is, you're allowed to have a bad day that doesn't go well. You're allowed to be sad. However, however, our, our thanks is for that Jesus' presence has never left us. 
He's never left us or forsaken us. Even when circumstances are hard, you can never let your current circumstances determine the presence of God. He is with you. Even though the circumstances may look like to you and the rest of the world that he's not, we don't believe in a God who is not with us. And this is important because people who are not close to God are watching you. You guys know that. If you call yourself a Christian and if you've made any sort of statement about, I'm a follower of Jesus, then you made yourself a mark. And whether people recognize that, they are kind of holding you to a standard. And when you, and we do this thing called negative connecting. It's kind of like how we relate to one another because nobody wants to be the guy like, my life's awesome, everything's great. And uh, at the same time, uh, when you start talking about how bad it is all the time, then that's painful. And like, if you could be a breath of fresh air for people that you are thankful for what God is doing in your life and you're just not always complaining about your spouse and your kids and your job, it might transform the culture because people want to be around someone that is not carrying like unbelievable amount of weight of the world all the time. Okay, Look, so the re I, I love that Paul leads with that because he's, he's about to go into like sharing hope with people. And the first thing is that your life has got to be not measured by the circumstances that you're reacting to, but rather the God of the ages who is far greater than any circumstance. Okay, now, look, look. So verse three. At the same time, pray also for us. Now, I, I love that Paul, like this is Paul, like the guy that wrote almost half the New Testament, Paul, like that guy. He's saying, hey, I need you guys to pray for me. If there's anybody, like, and you ever have someone go like, hey, how can I pray for you? Like, I'm good. Like, really? You're good? Like Paul, the guy that wrote almost half the Bible was not good. He was like, please pray for me. And I think what you mean is, and this is probably the problem with American Christianity. It, it might be this. One, I don't want to actually share my problems with you because I, don't, I think you'll judge me and you won't want to be around me. That, that could be it. Or two, I don't want to be a burden on anyone. I don't want to be a burden because I don't want you to have to feel like you're praying for me and I need you. The reality is you do need people. Do you guys know that you actually need other people? And if you come off like you don't, then you are, um, you are making the body of Christ depilitated because it can't serve you. Do you guys know that? All right, so here's Paul, 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 the guy that wrote, the New Testament, Paul. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on which, I, on, which on account of which I'm in prison and that I make, may make it clear, which is how I ought to speak. I love this. Here is Paul in prison. Now you would think, I would think, prison would be a place generally where you would have limited opportunities to share the gospel. And yet, here's where Paul's like, guys, I'm in prison. Pray for me that I'll be able to share the gospel. And you're like, well, how many people are you gonna talk to? Does it matter? Let's talk about the people that are chained to Paul. Like, remember, he's under house arrest in Rome where he was wanting to, re like, he, he went intentionally under guard to Rome for the purpose of hoping to share the gospel with Caesar. And so here he is in prison and he writes another letter at the same time he wrote the letter to the Colossians to the Philippians. And he talks about being chained up to the Praetorian guard. Look at this. He's like, listen, I want you to know, brothers, to the Philippians, uh, that what has happened to me being in prison has really served to advance the gospel. So that has become known throughout the whole Imperial Guard, all the best soldiers, all the elite people that were in Rome. Like you're not in Rome because you are like, you know, like, ah, couldn't really make it. I got stuck in Rome. No, these are the elite soldiers and these elite soldiers that are probably a little bit smarter, a little bit more equipped than the rest are stuck with Paul on guard shift for a while. And Paul's like, oh, you're next, excellent. Let's talk about where you are with Jesus. What is a Jesus? Well, let me share with you. And he would share with them about the life-changing reality of Jesus Christ and how Paul was a persecutor of the faith. And then he became a martyr in a sense of the faith because he wanted to share 
that Christ was who he was all about. And it became known that his imprisonment was for Christ. And most of the brothers, having become confident in the Lord, by my imprisonment, are much more bold to speak the word. So this limitation advanced the gospel. One of the things that um, I love to do, I love sharing Jesus. I don't know if you guys knew that about me. I love it. And um, I don't know that I also am a father of four, all right? So I have four children, and uh, that means that you sort of have to be at home. And so I'm not calling that a prison by any stretch of the imagination. You thought that I did not. I did not say that, okay? However, it is a limitation, okay? It is a limitation. And so I was like, God, if I am supposed to be sharing the hope of Jesus with people and my whole job is to go hang out with Christians during the day, and when am I going to go find some people who don't know Jesus? That was like sort of the thing that's been on my heart and on my mind. And so I was like, I know um, I can, after I put the kids down, why don't I open up my house and just see what dudes will come over and I will share the gospel with whoever will come over to my house. That was the plan, literal plan. Now, it took about two years. I went from about two people. It was like Chris Bowers and me, and that was it. And then eventually, over time, there's any, anywhere from about 25 to 30 people every, every Tuesday night at my house, and many of them don't know Jesus. And I've been praying. I said, like, God, you, you're in complete control of this. I need your help. I want you to bring whoever you are calling me to share the hope of the gospel with. Now, here's what's wild. You ready for this? I have been praying for my neighbors, okay? And one of my neighbors is actually here. He doesn't believe in Jesus, but I'm really grateful here. Austin, I have to call you out. I love Austin right here. He's my Jewish neighbor. I love Austin. He is so great. And uh, he lives right down the street from me. He would come by every now and then just going like, what is going on at that house with all the fire and all the men? And then he like, hey, can I come to that? I'm like, yes, you can. You can come. I didn't have to go to his house. He came to me. That was the way I kind of prayed it would happen. And it did. So thank you, Austin, for being here. So grateful that you're here, my man. I, what I want you to see though is, and like he knew I was going to say that. So it wasn't like, oh my gosh, you are so weird. I am weird, but well, all right. So um, here it is. Prayer. A faithful prayer life is part of gospel proclamation. It is part of it. And so, uh, Austin, I know, don't know if you know this, I pray for you all the time. I'm asking for the Lord to just work in your life and bring hope and joy and just like unbelievable favor in your life. Man, I appreciate that. And so what I want you to see is that like, that's my hope. And I'm so glad he's here. Now, now, Watch. I think when we're going back to this, this idea that a lot of us sort of operate like we don't need prayer. Like I just need to get out there and share the gospel. Um, and this is kind of how Peter operated. He's like, listen, like he would hear words and then he'd act. You remember G- Peter on the uh, Mount of Transfiguration? Um, he sees Jesus and Moses and Elijah and he's like, all right, check it out. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to start up a shop. I'm going to build a tabernacle for Jesus, Moses, and Elijah. What we're going to do is start running people up here. We'll start charging some money. We'll kind of make, I mean, he was going into those whole, and God has to shut him up and say, this is my son whom I love. Listen to him. And he's like, all right. Or, or what about this? Remember, like Jesus says, hey, watch and pray with me so that you don't fall into temptation. And literally like an hour, two hours later, there's Peter uh, at the trial of Jesus standing outside and a middle school girl comes up to him and says, aren't you with Jesus? And that's where he could have been, yes. And do you know that Jesus has come to be the Messiah, the savior of the world? No, he did not do it. He's like, what are you talking about? I don't even know the man. Here's what happens when we don't pray. Can I just be real with you? When we don't pray, when our prayer life is um, weak, what happens is you start to think that it's about you and what you can do. And you start comparing yourself. Remember, remember Peter, when he's walking along the beach with John and Jesus, he's like, hey, Jesus, what are you gonna do with John? Like, what, what's your plan for him? And God's like, or Jesus is like, what is it up? What does that matter to you? You follow me. And watch this. When you're not praying, you start looking and comparing at how everybody else is doing. I've been serving here. I've been working. What is everybody else doing? You kind of get angry about it, kind of get frustrated, and then you start pouting. 
Peter, Peter pouted a little bit. He had a little bit of pout in him. I'm going back fishing. And I think what happens for us when our prayer life is lacking and you start doing all these things for Jesus, it ends up hurting your heart and hurting your life. And you sort of kind of come out of this going like, as if God owed you something and you're not, not getting to, you've forgotten about the amazing salvation that he has granted. You don't sit and look at life as such joy and you miss out on the thankfulness of the small things because God is always faithful. Okay, don't, don't be Peter. Be a person that loves Jesus. And I, I think one of, one of the things I've just really felt joy in is in, in my own prayer life where I got to watch uh, you may know Tony Nelson. I prayed 24 months for Tony Nelson. He finally came to Jesus. Uh, Chris Dayton, I think I prayed 18 months for him. And Adrian's like, you need to stop praying for him. It's never going to happen. Just move on. And I was like, no, no, I'm not. And then boom, one day he just called and said, I want to receive Christ. It's a wild experience. I think John Milton, uh, he's like seven feet tall, that guy. Uh, like I remember praying for him. It only took four months. I don't know how long it's going to take for people to come to faith. And I don't want to say that my prayers were the ones, but my prayers, I feel like activated and were a part of God's will. And I played a huge role in people coming to faith. But one plants, one waters, but God gives the increase. And I want to know, don't you want to be involved? Don't you want to be involved in someone's faith walk? Don't you want to be, I'm so, I know it hasn't happened yet, Austin, but one day, whenever the Lord opens up your heart to believe, my heart is going to be like rejoicing. And I know it's going to be why it played a part in that. I know other people are going to be, have played a part in our men's group and all the different people that played a part that kind of got him here. But I will be just thinking, thank you, Jesus, for what you did because you have loved people. I love Maddie, who every week serves on the camera. Love you, Maddie. And every week he sets up. I mean, there's nobody that serves our church more than Maddie. Like every morning, every Sunday morning, he sets up everything you see on the outside is a guy that doesn't know Jesus yet, and he hasn't known Jesus yet for 10 years, and we are praying for Maddie. And I'm so grateful that you're here. And I, my heart is, I don't know how that's all gonna happen, but wouldn't that be awesome if, God, if we started as a church, we said, we really believe that prayer changes things. And we started praying intentionally for our neighbors, where, wherever we live, work, and play. We said, I am gonna make a difference for the kingdom because God can use my prayer. Okay, keep moving. So it's not just prayer, right? So there's, there's more than that. And watch what Paul writes. He says, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. Now, walk in wisdom toward outsiders, making the best use of the time. The best way to put this is like purchasing the time or redeeming the time. Like these, there are going to be targets of opportunity. That's what we call them in the military. Like you're, you're running a route, route clearance and all of a sudden you have a high value target. You're like, hey, everybody, there's someone we can go arrest and take down. This isn't, it might be a bad analogy, but uh, it's not like we're walking around for people to take down, but rather opportunities for people to share the gospel with. And what if I say, oh, wow, look at this opportunity that God's given me. Make the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious seasoned with salt so that you may know how may know how you ought to answer each person. I think this to me says a lot that you're going to walk in wisdom. That means you've got to get to know people. You've got to listen to them. You've got to eat with them. You've got to serve people or what we found is that being served them and then you're going to know how to listen. I think listening is so huge. Now watch. Care, a wise walk is part of gospel proclamation. In other words, um, there's, there's kind of two pieces. One, living your life in a way that others, they may not want to emulate it. Like, I don't know how many lost people are like, I, oh, they kind of, whenever I was in the military, everyone sort of thought I was like Ned Flanders crossed with Rambo. That was kind of like, and nobody was like thinking, I really want to be that. But I, they needed me to be that. Because that's what made life sort of functional because they could go and do whatever because they knew that there was some stability in the world because of the way that, I live my life. Not that I was anywhere perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but when I was functional, it brought their like reality, like gave a little bit of a basis for them to work from. All right. And then also when your life is together, when you have a wise walk, people are going to ask you questions when they say, tell me how you raise your kids. 
Tell me how it seems like your, your, you and your spouse have some sort of relationship and you're not just living like roommates. Tell me how you haven't gone from toxic relationship to toxic relationship and you're just constantly in the next one wondering when that one's gonna be done. Like when you can live your life, listen, whether you're single or married or whatever, when you have a, a walk about you that has some confidence to it, that like you're going directionally and you're not just blown and tossed by whatever wind that you're trying to respond to. It makes a difference. So watch. So uh, the wise walk is part of gospel proclamation. So, and I think what I mean by this is uh, I think there's a tendency not to care. And Jonah is a perfect guy, example of a guy who actually did not care. Right. Remember Jonah, he was told by God to go share uh, with Nineveh 40 days and God's gonna wipe you guys out. And Jonah didn't wanna go. Why didn't Jonah wanna go? He's like, I just know they're gonna repent. Sigh. God, you're so gracious, you're so loving. Oh, I knew it. Why? Because Jonah, at his heart, was a bigot, right? He looked at everybody else that wasn't uh, of Israel as the enemy. He looked at everybody of Israel, and to be fair, they were. Nineveh would eventually conquer Israel. The Assyrians would take them over. So the very thing he feared actually happened. But he couldn't see that God has a plan for his And so his heart was, I'm going to be hard towards them. I don't know who your neighbor is. You may not have an awesome neighbor like Austin, but you might have a neighbor that where you live, work, and play where like maybe they have a different political view than you and you're like, mm, I saw their sign out. Strike them with thunder and lightning. Hopefully their house burns down, they have to move. Like I think that's where a lot of us go. And I think that that's where it's like, why not one love them? Because isn't that what God's heart is? One of my, uh, so I want us to be more whole, holistic. Uh, one of my favorite stories here is um, Robert Sass, you know, one of our elders. Um, uh, he, he is a person that imbibes, emulates, share the gospel wherever you live, work, or play. And um, he has to get his hair cut because his hair keeps growing. And so he's like, I'm gonna go wherever I am, whoever is gonna cut my hair, I'm gonna just make it a point for, to, to talk to that person specifically and pray for that person specifically about Jesus. And so 15 years ago, 50, that's a lot of years. That's a lot of hair. And so he went to uh, this lady, her name's Ashley, to get his hair cut. And about 10 years ago, I found out about this, that he'd been praying for Ashley the person that was cutting his hair. And he's like, I just, I'm, I'm hoping that one day she'll come to church. And he would pray for her. And then he would say, and before he went to go get his hair cut, hey, uh, I'm going to get my hair cut by Ashley today. Would you pray for her? I'm like, I, I, and it's not that I didn't think anything would happen, but I mean, it's like, you kind of just don't think things happen. This, do you know what I'm talking about? You're like, yeah, I, Robert, you're a really godly guy. I'm sure you're really kind. And then I was like, okay, I'll pray for that. And I don't know who Ashley is. It's hard to get context. I've never seen a picture of Ashley. I didn't know who Ashley was, what she looked like, any of that. But I was like, Robert's going, but Robert wasn't worried about how, what I thought about it. He was just like, hey, pray for me also. I'm about to go get my hair cut with Ashley. Okay. Years go by, years go by, years go by. And by this point, um, you hear so much about Ashley that you're like, does she really exist? You know, you're like, is it possible you're just making this up? You know, I, 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 he wouldn't lie like that, but there was a part of it that was like, I, how, man, we're at like year 15. And then one day he's like, hey, Ashley said she's coming to church. I'm like, I bet she, you've told me that before, that she might. Is this really, it? and all of a sudden one day Ashley showed up yeah. and she's sitting right over there. Woo! Isn't that wild? Like, and, she, and what she told me is that, uh, that Robert was kind 
and he would ask about her, about her whole life. And eventually in her world, she's like, I need to start going to church somewhere. And she came. And then after she got here, she's been meeting with Julie Medford, who's been kind and has been, let me help you grow spiritually. And she's never been a part of a church family before, right? And this has been one of those things to watch Ashley just see the gospel penetrate her life because Robert has been faithful for 15 years to really care about the people that he lives, works, and plays with. Now, wouldn't that, no, think about that. Think about the life change in Ashley's life where she's going to go, and for 15 years, this guy kept coming in and I didn't want to hear it, or I didn't really, I mean, it was, he's a nice guy, but is it that real? And what if it's real? What if the gospel is really true and Jesus came, died on a cross, rose from the dead, gave you his Holy Spirit, said, I want you, Robert, to go and impact every person you meet. And if you know Robert, he goes to impact every person he meets. And the evidence is all around you. And many of you have been impacted by Robert in this ministry. And I'm so grateful for that. I'm so grateful, Ashley, that you're here. And she's got her son with her, which is wild. I love that too. Isn't that cool? So I'm so grateful. It's a two for one day here at getting your hair cut. I, that's what gets me pumped up and excited. Who knew what God could do? Because someone cared enough to take the message of hope everywhere he went, which then gets us to this last part. Like, remember, we, Paul prayed, hey, pray that I could make this clear. I want, pray that my conversation would be seasoned with salt so I would know how to answer everyone. In other words, when you share, you want to have gracious speech is going to be, is part of gospel proclamation to which you're like, okay, got it. Like, I think sometimes um, when it comes to gracious speech, uh, have you ever heard this saying, preach Christ, always use words if necessary? Have you ever heard that? And many people attribute to St. Francis of Assisi, which he actually never said. Can I just get that off the table or on the table? Like that is a rumor. In the first 200 years after St. Francis was alive, there is zero quotes of him. That came far later of people attributing that phrase to him. In fact, if you know anything about St. Francis, which I, I hope you do because he's awesome. Uh, he was like a preacher that I could say, kind of like me. He said when he preached, he was like he was dancing on the stage. Like the guy was constant movement. He was fiery. He was sharing Christ. In fact, during the fifth crusade, all right, here's a fun fact for all my crusade uh, buffs, because I know that's kind of what you study in world lit, I guess. Uh, anyway, so he goes to the fifth crusade. The, it's been a, a complete abysmal failure, but he goes to a sultan in Egypt and he, he like says, hey guys, hold, let's stop fighting for a second. I'm gonna go over and talk to the sultan. And you know, the sultan greeted him and then gave him opportunities to preach all over the world. And many think that was because he became a believer because St. Francis shared the gospel with him. Now, I just, because I think sometimes we, we've heard this, they you know, preach Christ always and if necessary, use words. Words are necessary. In fact, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And so we need to be a people that are sharing that. And I was like, how? I would love to teach you how to share the gospel. All right, you ready? This is my favorite way. Are you guys ready? And I did stick figures because I was going to put a whiteboard up here, but then I've been told don't do that. So here is, here is my stick figure on something you can see. All right. This is you and God. Well, at least you and God, the history of God. And back when God created everything, it was like, what a great relationship. Everything's perfect. And then one day, boom, sin came and it made a big problem. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. What does that mean? There is a chasm, a gap between you and God that you can't get. You can do a lot of good things, right? You're gonna probably try. Like you're gonna do a lot of great work. You're gonna try not sinning a whole lot, but the reality is you're going to sin. You're gonna... You haven't murdered anybody. Congratulations. You have not murdered. However, you thought about it. You, I mean, come on. You're like, I just want them to die peacefully in their sleep tomorrow. Like, you know, you've, you've, you've gone, you've, you've had those thoughts, you've had those dark moments. And so 
Um, your, uh, I think your view of yourself is you're like right here, but you're actually more over here. And the reality is, I think this is where you've fallen short over and over again. And it makes God and you cannot coexist together because of your sin. And this sin is such a nasty word, isn't it? It makes people feel uncomfortable. We probably all should say it together. Sin. All right. Even it's sin. Yeah. It kind of has like an evil like tone to it. And it, what I mean by that is, it, your good works or your lack of being bad is kind of how we, we kind of measure ourselves because we're constantly comparing. And if you knew that God said, be perfect as I am perfect, well, crud, who can be saved? Exactly. That's the bad news. In fact, the bad news is the wages of sin is death. There's nothing you can do to get across this chasm other than die. And when we say death, we're not talking like, oh, well, you know, you're going to die and be buried in the ground and it's, you know, you're just worm food. No, the second half is the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God's eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Meaning if this, the wages of sin is death, the opposite of that is eternal life. So it's eternal death, separation from God from, for forever. Okay, so what, what do we do? There's hope. He gives us hope, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus. This is Romans 6.23. And if you're wondering, this is exactly how I share the gospel with every single person I meet. I go through these. I'm about to show you four, four verses. Romans 5a, God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So good news, good news. Like Jesus takes on hell for us. And I tell this to people almost every time. I said, when did Christ die for you? Before you got your life together or after you got your life together? And everyone's like, well, I mean, it was before I was born. So before, yes. But also, um, he doesn't say like, get your life together first, be perfect first, and then I'll accept you. He understands that you cannot be perfect because you're already so screwed up. You can't do it. And so this is the good news. Jesus came. And that's why we sing the songs. He, while you were still broken mess, angry, frustrated, tired, and treating your spouse terribly, treating your children awfully, treating your coworkers painfully, being the toxic person in the relationship over and over again. And the reason you know that is because there's been several relationships and you're the common denominator. That's, that's another issue. Okay, what happens is, is that we understand that then eventually Romans 10, 9 says, if you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. So what that means is you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, he is my king. And you're still gonna mess up even after you believe that. But you're gonna say, I want my life to align with him, not with me. And I believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead, you'll be saved. Okay, that is how you become close to God because God did all the work. It's not based on your work, it's based on his work. And so this is why I would say to you, listen, for many of you, I've talked to you and you're like, I don't wanna get baptized till I've arrived. And I'm like, um, baptism is the first thing that you do, not the last thing. Because if if we had to get our lives together first before we could be baptized, nobody here would be baptized. Nobody. You would have, it would just be like, well, one day we really hope for a baptism. We're really pulling for Robert because like he can make it. <laughs> no, no, it's the first thing you do. And I think what sometimes people, they don't want to get in, into the baptism because like if I get baptized and then my life is a train wreck the following week, I'm going to be a big hypocrite you already are a hypocrite. And I'm not saying that that's good. I'm saying that, well, I'm saying that Jesus is the one that changes you from the inside out. The gospel isn't about making bad people better. It's about making dead people alive and you celebrate your aliveness by, and the fact you're born again by being baptized. That's the joy of it. And that's why we sing the songs. That's why everyone cries. And you're like, why is everybody crying? Because we saw a miracle happen in your life. Okay. And I, I think that's important enough for us to sort of wrap our head around of like all of this joy. And so you're like, all right, that, I mean, that's that simple. That's the gospel in four, four verses. And if you're like, where do I, where can I find that later? Because I forgot to take pictures. Just everyone get this evangelism QR code. This is on our website. I did a little like how to share the gospel flip snack book on 
our website. You can just go bloop, put it up there, and I would love for you to share the hope. And you could do it wrong. You know you could do it wrong, and probably God could still use it. Did you know that God is in control of your words and how people receive stuff? And if you have a willing heart, I would love for you to go and share the hope that you have and go, I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it poorly. Did you know that God can use you doing the, the sharing the gospel poorly and then make you better over time? I think there's this part of us like, I don't want to mess it up and like ruin somebody's soul. I, just follow the scripture. The scripture isn't going to mess it up for you, I promise. And I want you, if you're praying and you care and you share, oh, wow. The Lord is going to do great things in and through you. So here's, here's really the question. As I want this to be the heartbeat of our church. I want everywhere you go, I want, I want with Cora Fong and Apple, I want everybody there to, they already know Cora loves Jesus. And I want, uh, I want more Coras that wherever she is, she's like, Hey, everybody, here's, she took her pastor to work day. That was, if you want to take me to work with you, I love being your show and tell. <laughs> it was like before Easter last year and she takes me to work. She's like, this is my pastor. And I'm like, hey, everybody. And everyone's like. <laughs> but I love that. I was like, oh, she don't care what people think. And I love that. And I think Jesus loves that. And I think her office is, I think Apple is blessed by that. And so the question I want to leave us with is which part, prayer, care, or share, is God convicting you to develop as we bless? Now, listen, if you're just here today and this is your first time, Austin, so glad you're here. And you're like, uh, you're like, I don't even, like, what are you talking about? I just showed up here because they begged me to come. And you just gave me a full gospel presentation. I feel a little bait and switch. No, uh, here's, here's the reality. If you don't know Jesus today, this is for you. I want you to make a decision for Christ today. And it simply goes like this. Hey, I read everything that you put on that screen. I, I know I can't get to heaven on my own. I know that I'm weak and I am lost without you, Jesus. And I want Jesus. If that's you, would you text us? This isn't like a magic text, but it is a text that starts the process where you get to take the next step in your spiritual journey. And one of our elders, maybe Robert, will get back with you and he'll walk you through what the gospel means and how it impacts your life specifically. That would move my heart for you to make a decision for Jesus Christ today. Um, but for the rest of us, how is the Lord convicting you to develop? Let's pray. Father, thank you for your love and for your grace and for your mercy. And Jesus, I'm praying that as we um, look at our prayer life, our care life, and our share life, that you, Lord, would speak into it. And you would convict us of where we need to grow. And God, I'm praying that for somebody here who is far from you, and they sure want to share it if they had something to share. But right now, life is hard, and last night was harder, and it's been an exhausting, weary ride. And, and Jesus, would you speak right to them to say, don't wait. Reach out now. Lord, allow them to see you, run to you, not run from you to get their life together, but run to you to get their life from death. We love you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said, Amen. Amen.